welcome, and um, what a beautiful group you are. It's so wonderful to see the kind of community that's here that can cook together, that can eat together, that can sing together. Uh, those songs were amazing, and the words of those songs were so profound that I feel like my whole speech has been said uh, and um, sung, which is even better. Uh, Kathy mentioned that last hearing, and I, I wanted to talk about that. Raise your hand if you follow it at all, the Brennan confirmation issues. And if you didn't, so for those who didn't, um, it was quite an amazing uh, look at where we stand politically today. Because here you had a guy, John Brennan, who had been nominated to be the head of the CIA when Obama was first elected. And it caused such a controversy because of his position within the CIA during the time of the Bush administration that was involved in torture and all these horrible things, that he had to resign and withdraw his nomination. So four years later, he gets nominated again by President Obama. Now that's four years after he's been the mastermind of this drone program. One would think, with all the strikes against him during the Bush administration, add on to that the horrors of the drone program, that this guy would be unconfirmable again. But no, something very strange happened. And that is, he's nominated by President Obama, and then he comes before the Intelligence Committee, and he comes for his confirmation hearing. And some of us had recently returned from a trip to Pakistan where we'd met with these drug victims. We couldn't believe this guy had been nominated. And people came from all over the country. You might know uh, Colonel Ann Wright, who lives in Hawaii, flew in from Hawaii to D.C. Uh, you might... Well, there, there's a, an older woman from uh, Indianapolis drove by herself in the snow from Indianapolis to Washington, D.C. to be at that hearing. Uh, another woman, Toby Blome, coming in from California. And we had decided that we had to stand up and say something during this hearing. So we had kind of talked together and said, okay, you go first, then you go, then you go, then you go. And we had about 12 people. And we know when we get up during these hearings and speak out, the chances are you're going to get arrested. And it's not that we like getting arrested. It's really not a lot of fun to go to jail, um, especially since you have to come back for a, a hearing, you have to come back for a trial. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of expense. And, um, but we felt that it was important to do that. So as soon as John Brennan walked in the room, and you know, these rooms are very uh, stately, and the whole thing is supposed to be very uh, professional, and you're supposed to be sort of overwhelmed by the ceremony of being in these hearings. And there, John Brennan walks in, and all of a sudden, already all hell breaks loose, because we start pulling out our signs, we try to get as close as we can. The gavel goes down, we sit down, and then he tries to speak. And one by one, number one gets up, Number two gets up. Number three gets up. Uh, Joanne Lingle, the woman that drove in from Indianapolis, she had a list of these people that you have right here, these young people, all under 18 years old, 176 names of children. And she held it up, and the papers are falling down, and she's saying, John Brennan, you said that we don't kill civilians. Here is a list of names of 176 children that have been killed. If you don't have this, let me give it to you. And she's getting pulled out. The woman from California stands up on the chair, holding up a, a, a rag doll in her hand, and says to not only John Brennan, but the chair of the committee, Diane Feinstein, says, are your children more important than the children in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Somalia? Aren't their children as precious as our children? And she's saying that while she gets dragged away. And then the fifth one it pops up, and then Diane Feinstein really has had enough at that point. <laughs> and she says, all right, we're going to close this hearing, and Code Pink and all of the associates will leave the room. Now, of course, who's a associate of Code Pink? <laughs> it turned out that it was basically everybody in the room. So she clears the public hearing. And then they go on in basically uh, 
uh, just the, the staff people, and um, continue with this farce of a confirmation process. And the hardest questions that they ask him are, why can't we have the memos that are written by the Justice Department and we've been asking for for two years that give the legal justification for the drone killing? Now think about that for a minute. This is the Intelligence Committee in the Senate that is supposed to do the oversight of the CIA. This guy is there to be confirmed as head of the CIA. And they have been begging the administration for two years just to see the legal documents. And they haven't been able to get the legal documents. How could you possibly do any kind of oversight if you can't even read the documents that lay out the legal justification for the drug program. Astounding. And astounding that they had to wait for this confirmation hearing as an opportunity to say, you know, we're not saying that we won't confirm this guy, but we really like some of these memos. Well, it took the Republicans to stand up and get a little harsher. And it took Rand Paul to make a real spectacle out of this confirmation process. Now raise your hand if you like the politics of Rand Paul when it comes to social justice kinds of issues. <laughs> raise your hand if you were happy to hear Rand Paul do that filibuster on the floor of the Senate. So think about that for a moment as well. Um, it took a Tea Party Republican and his Tea Party Republican friends like Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio to say the things that the liberal Democrats in Congress, in the Senate, were not willing to say. And we went around as Code Pink to the offices of the liberal senators. And we said, why aren't you speaking up? We went and met with Elizabeth Warren. We said, your voice is so critical around these economic issues. Can't you say something about these killer drones and about John Brennan? And she said, oh, I'm so busy with the economic issues, blah, blah, blah. We went to Tammy Baldwin, a brand new senator, fabulous, progressive senator. And we said, Tammy, you've been so wonderful in the Congress. You have to speak out and say something against John Brennan and these killer drones. And she said, oh, I'm new to the Congress and uh, to the Senate, and I have to kind of beef up on these issues before I can speak out. We went to Al Franken. We went to Sherrod Brown. We said, where are your voices? And then came the confirmation process itself. So who voted for John Brennan? Involved in torture under the Bush years and involved in murder under the Obama years? The Democrats. The Democrats. Just about every single one of the Democrats in the Senate voted in favor of John Brennan. And just about every single Republican voted against John Brennan. It does not make any sense. The only sense it makes is if you understand how broken our two-party system is and how the Democrats only voted for the torture and the murderer because he was President Obama's torture and murderer. If he had been George Bush's torture and murderer, they wouldn't have voted for him. Something is wrong with this picture. It was wrong when President Bush invaded Iraq on the basis of lies and destroyed that country and now we are facing the 10 year anniversary where so many US soldiers and many many more Iraqis were killed. It was wrong when President Bush was involved in sweeping up about a thousand people and throwing them into Guantanamo where about a hundred of them remain in detention after 10 years. Most of them cleared for release but not released. It was wrong for George Bush to say we could do enhanced interrogation meeting, i.e. torture. It was wrong under the Bush administration to pick up people and take them extraordinary rendition to other countries where we knew they would be tortured. All of that was wrong. But you know what? It's wrong when under President Obama they are using killer drones to kill people in countries where we are even not at war. 
It is wrong when President Obama is involved on Terror Tuesdays bringing his advisors to the White House and setting up a kill list and playing the role of prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner all at once. That is wrong. It is wrong for President Bush to give the military and the CIA the right to do something called signature strikes, which is to kill people we don't know who they are on the basis of suspicious behavior. Suspicious behavior in the eyes of remote pilots who are sitting in air-conditioned rooms in places in U.S. air bases like outside of Las Vegas or in upstate New York and deciding what is suspicious behavior. It is wrong for our president to give these entities like the CIA and the Joint Special Operation Command the right to do secondary strikes, which means after you send in the first round of strikes, you send in another round of strikes to get the people that had run away the first time. And guess what? That is when you're going in and killing the people who are rescuing the first group that was hit. That is called a war crime, killing rescuers. And guess what? It is also wrong to violate the sovereignty of other countries. I don't know if you just saw this week that the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights went to Pakistan and interviewed government officials and went to the areas where we are using the drones and interviewed drone strike victims and said, guess what? The U.S. is violating the sovereignty of the Pakistani people. The government of Pakistan has been speaking out against this, and the U.S. is not listening, and that is wrong. It is wrong to so stretch the meaning of imminent danger that is part of international law to say that we can kill people, not just people who might be about to bomb us, to hurt us, but people who might someday, somewhere, somehow want to do something against us. That is not what imminent threat means according to the law, but that's how it's being twisted and turned right now. It is wrong to even give the CIA these lethal drones because the CIA is not a military organization. The CIA is a civilian organization. The CIA is supposed to gather intelligence. It is not supposed to be a death squad, which it has become now. It is wrong to terrorize entire populations in our war on terror. And we heard this when we went to Pakistan and talked to people in the tribal areas. We heard it when we went to Gaza and saw how the Israeli military were using the drones. These drones are a technological wonder because they can stay above the villages for hours and hours on end, for days and days on end. And guess what? They don't just kill and maim people, they terrorize the entire population. They make children afraid to go out of their homes to go to school. They make the people afraid to go to the marketplace, afraid to gather anywhere, like in uh, in, in weddings or in funerals because the U.S. drones have attacked the funerals. They're afraid to go to community meetings known as jurgas where they're supposed to resolve village problems because that has been seen by these remote pilots thousands of miles away as suspicious activity and the drones have killed people at these jurgas. It is wrong to terrorize entire populations in something that we call our war on terror. It is wrong to lie to the American people, to lie to us about civilian casualties, to say there have been almost no civilian casualties. And then we hear from another right-wing Senator, Lindsey Graham, who says, it looks like there have been about 4,700 people killed by these drones. But the U.S. can only name 2% of those people. Who are the rest of them? We want to know. We have a right to know. It is wrong to kill people overseas who we have not charged with anything, who have not had a chance to surrender, a chance to any kind of due process, and it is certainly wrong to kill Americans overseas who thought that being an American citizen meant they had something, the right to a judicial process. 
It is especially wrong to kill a 16-year-old American citizen born in Denver by the name of Abdul Rahman Awlalaki to kill him in a separate drone strike in Yemen and refuse to acknowledge it, refuse to even say he was killed by a U.S. drone, refuse to explain why, was a 16-year-old a high-level operative in Al-Qaeda? Or was it a, it a mistake? John Brennan said in his hearings, if we kill people by mistake, we should acknowledge it. Our government has not acknowledged that we've killed a 16-year-old American citizen by mistake. It is wrong to bypass Congress in something so absolutely critical as a decision to get involved in military activities. And this is exactly what has been happening. When the Obama administration tried, decided to get involved in the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, they said there is no reason for us to go to Congress because we are only going to use drones. And when we use drones, there are no US citizens' lives at risk. And so that is not a war. So something like the War Powers Act has nothing to do with this. That is an abuse of presidential powers, and it is wrong. It is wrong to be building more US military bases overseas. There are already way too many US military bases overseas. And now, under the Obama administration, with this expansion of the use of drones, has come an expansion in military bases for those drones. And they are peppering the Middle East and Africa now with new US bases. One of these bases in Saudi Arabia. Now, do you remember that one of the reasons Osama bin Laden said that we were attacked on 9-11 is because we had bases in the holy lands of Saudi Arabia? And quietly, George Bush closed those bases. And now we have, under President Obama, the opening of a base in Saudi Arabia. This will blow back against us. We are sowing the seeds for another attack on U.S. soil. And this is happening under the Obama administration. We are opening new bases in Africa, in Djibouti, in the Seychelles, the islands, and now in Niger, to be using these drones in Mali, and who knows where else in Africa, because this is a secret program, and we, the American people, are not allowed to know what our government is doing in our name. So here we are at a crossroads, where suddenly, thanks to the hearings of John Brennan, Suddenly, a lot of information is coming out about the use of these drones. A lot of people are getting educated. And some of the very people who in polls in the past have said it was OK to use drones to kill terrorist suspects. And you know what a suspect is. Somebody who hasn't been charged or tried or, or convicted of anything. But a year ago, 83% of Americans, including a majority of people who call themselves liberal Democrats, said that it was OK to kill those people with our drones. Suddenly, this is starting to turn. And we're seeing new polls coming out to say it's down now in the 50 percentile. New polls that are saying it's not right to kill Americans with drones. And people starting to ask questions about this drone program, to ask questions about whether this is really making us more secure or not. So this is an opportune time for us to have this discussion and to think of how are we going to seize this moment to turn the situation around. Because whether it's under a Republican or a Democratic president, we have to speak up and say, that military solutions are not the answer. In the book, in the book I wrote, I had a, a talk about a study done by 
a group that looked at 268 terrorist organizations in the last 40 years and said, how did those organizations come to their demise? Well, only 7% came to their demise through military action. 43% came to their demise through better policing. And 45% came to their demise through becoming incorporated into the political process. And that means negotiations. It means conflict resolution. It means creative diplomacy. And we are at a point now where the world and we inside the United States have to start demanding creative diplomacy. It is wrong to say that everything is on the table. When we talk about Iran right now, everything should not be on the table because a military invasion of Iran should not be on the table. What should be on the table is creative diplomacy. And look what's happening in North Korea right now. You want to know where we get an example of creative diplomacy? Dennis Rodman. That's right. This huge guy who's got piercings through every orifice in his body <laughs> decides that he is going to go to North Korea and talk to the leadership there. That is creative diplomacy. That's the kind of thing we need, like you did in your song. I want to talk to my enemy and I want to invite them for tea in Bethlehem. That is creative diplomacy. That is the kind of beautiful initiatives that the world is crying out for. The world is crying out for solutions. Solutions to the climate crisis that might destroy life on Earth. Solutions to the wars that are raging all over. Solutions to poverty that we have in our own country and dire poverty that we have in places throughout the Middle East and Africa. I mean, just think of using drones in a place like Mali where people don't even have clean water to drink. The world is crying out for creative, nonviolent solutions. And I want to end with the story of a dele our delegation that went to Pakistan. Because there were 32 of us that decided that we would go to a very scary place, Pakistan, because we were so disgusted with our government's policies and so just determined to tell the Pakistani people that we were opposed to killing their children. And so 43 of us raised money in our communities, flew to Islamabad, met at a small hotel in Islamabad, and we looked around the room and I said, how many of you had a loved one who said, please do not go on this trip? And every single one of them raised their hand. And the U.S. Embassy, the ambassador, came to talk to us twice. He said, you shouldn't be here, and certainly you shouldn't try to go to the tribal regions. We know that there are people in the Taliban who are going to try to kill you. And everybody decided to take that risk and go. And we went to the tribal areas, and we woke up in the morning to talk to a sea of people who, according to our government, wanted to kill us. And that sea of people, when we went up on the stage, were saying in English, welcome, welcome, we want peace, we want peace. And we got a chance to address this sea of people, saying, your children are as precious as our children. We do not want our government to continue to kill you with drones or with anything else and we will work as hard as we can to go back and change our government's policies. And in this country where polls said that three out of four Pakistanis think the United States is its enemy because of the drones. We were on the front pages of the papers in Pakistan every day we were there. We were on the television when we were there. And when we spoke before those people, a Pashtun man that would have looked to the remote pilot thousands of miles away as a suspicious character because he had a beard and a turban, he said to us, he put his hand on his heart, and he said, if you came here to win our hearts and minds, you have done that. And a woman said, you have done more for the positive image of the American people than the billions of dollars your government has been giving our country. 
And so it's that kind of creative diplomacy that we need. Because if we continue to allow our government to shower the world, whether it's Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Mali, with Hellfire missiles for Predator and Reaper drones, we will reap Hellfire. But if we shower the, word, the world with affection, with love, with kindness, with creative diplomacy, with humanitarian aid that actually lifts people out of poverty, we will find in return that we will be showered with love and with kindness. So I thank you for all the work you have done for so many years to turn around our government's policies. I know I'm speaking to the choir here when I say how important it is for us to keep up this work no matter who is in the White House. But I feel we do have a moment right now to turn this situation around, to convince our sisters and brothers in this country that we are on the wrong path to convince the people in Congress whether they are Republicans who are doing this to get at President Obama or whether they are liberal Democrats like Bob Casey who should be speaking out about this issue. We will force them to change our policy to one that does shower the world with love and with kindness. Thank you so much for what you do.